our discussion today is with regards to auditors. We are going to look at who actually is the auditors of a company and why is it so important to have an auditors and what actually the qualification which need to be fulfilled by an auditors. So who is, who is actually an auditor under the law, under the Companies Act 2016? So why actually is it so important for a company to have an auditors? So actually the Companies Act provides that it is actually compulsory to appoint an auditor so that the auditor can check the company affairs and then to report it to the shareholders. Why is it so? This is because this inspection, which is being done by an independent by an independent body, who is actually the auditor, this is the only guarantee to the shareholder that actually there will not be a misappropriation of the money which is being invested by the shareholders. Okay, so let us look at for a private company and for a public company when actually this auditor need to be appointed. So under section 267, subsection 1, for a private company, it shall appoint for each financial year of the said company. Whereas for a public company under section 271, subsection 1, a public company shall be appointed for each financial year of the state company. So what is the difference here? The difference is that for a private company, the word is shall appoint. This is actually a present tense. Whereas for a public company, the word actually which exists there is shall be appointed. So this is in a past tense. So meaning for a public company, the auditor, once the company had already been formed, they need to appoint an auditor. Whereas the situation is different for a private company, they can't appoint the auditor when they need to produce the financial statement. So if an auditor is being appointed, then under section 264, subsection 5, the person or a partner of an auditor of an auditor firm which is being appointed as an auditor, they must give their consent before they are being appointed. So meaning they cannot be for forced to perform the task of an auditor of an organization. A consent from this person who, who will be acting as an auditor should be obtained first. So if the auditor is being appointed then who actually will be paying the remuneration or the fee of the auditor. So under section 274, subsection 1, whoever appoints the auditor, then the body or the person who appoints the auditor must pay the remuneration of that auditor. So if the auditor is being appointed by the company, then the company will, will decide actually how much remuneration need to be paid to this auditor. So however, if the auditor, if let's say, is being appointed by the registrar of companies, the registrar of CCM, the Commissioner Companies of Malaysia, then the amount of remuneration will be decided by the registrar. Okay, so now we are going to look at the appointment of auditors since we already fully aware that an auditor must be appointed by a company to actually protect the interest of the shareholder. So we are going to look at now the difference between a private company and a public company as to actually when actually the auditors need to be appointed first before we go, go before we are going to go on with who actually is qualified to become the company's auditor. So section 267 subsection 1 and section 271 subsection 1 
With regard to when the auditor need to be appointed, I have discussed earlier whereby I have differentiated that for a private company, the word shall appoint is in a present tense, whereas for a public company, the word shall be appointed, which actually is in the past tense. So I will not be discussing this section anymore because I have discussed it in the previous slide. So now we are going to look at section 267, subsection 2, whereby for a private company, the registrar can't exempt an auditor from being appointed because if, let's say, this private company is a small company, then under that situation, they can apply to the registrar to be exempted from appointing an auditor. And that under section 267, subsection 3, if this is a newly incorporated company, then under the situation, the board shall appoint an auditor for this company because at that particular time, there is no meeting because maybe the members of the company, because it is only being formed, they don't have any members yet. They only have the board of directors. They're under the situation to fill any casual vacancy. So this can be done by the board because this is a newly incorporated company. Then under section two, 267, subsection 4, this is again for a private company. The members shall appoint an auditor by an ordinary resolution in the following years. So if the said company had been formed for few years, this is not the first year of the company, then for the following years, then the members shall appoint this auditor through an ordinary resolution if the board fails actually to appoint an auditor for the company. And under section 268, if the state company, meaning the members and the board, fails to appoint an auditor, then under the situation, if there is an application from any of the member of the board, from any of the members, sorry, from any of the member of the companies, that under the situation, if an application is being made to the registrar of companies, then under the situation, the registrar may appoint an auditor. Okay, we have completed with regard to private company, with regard to the appointment of an auditor towards a private company. So now we are going to discuss with regard to the appointment of the auditors for a public company. So as I told you earlier, section 200, 271, subsection 1, I have discussed it in the previous slide. So now we are going to go on with section 271, subsection 2, whereby this is with regards to the appointment of auditor, which is being done by the board before the first annual general meeting is being conducted. So meaning if there is a vacancy with regards to the auditor in that company, and this is with regards to a new company which, which have just been formed and the annual general meeting have not been conducted yet, then the power of appointing an auditor is being given to the board of directors. Then under section 271, subsection 4, during the annual general meeting, the members shall appoint an audit auditor by ordinary resolution also. If the company fails to appoint an auditor or if the board fails to appoint an auditor, then it can be done by the members through an ordinary resolution at the annual general meeting. This is being done through both. And under section 272, for public company, if let's say the company fails to appoint the auditor, then if there is any application done by a member 
in writing with regards to the failure to appoint an auditor, then the registrar will take action. The auditor, the the auditor then will be appointed by the registrar under this situation. So, we are still discussing with regards to the appointment of auditors. Now we are going to look at the qualification of an auditor. Who can actually become an auditor? What are the qualifications need to be fulfilled by a person before she can be qualified to become an auditor of a company? So there are actually 10 qualifications here because the first three qualifications, these are the qualification which is being laid down under section 263. So if person wanted to become a company auditor, so these have to be approved by the Minister of Finance. However, before the Minister of Finance can approve a person to become a company auditor, first of all, of course, that person need to obtain a necessary qualification, yeah, meaning he must be a registered chartered accountant under Accountants Act 1967 and to be able to do this, of course, that person firstly need to obtain certain certificate, maybe a degree or a certain certificate from certain board uh, with regards to his qualification as professional. Then he have to obtain this first and then he also have to uh, satisfy the minister that he is of good character and he is competent to perform his duties as a as, as an auditor. Okay, then only the minister might consider whether to approve him as an auditor or not. Okay, so these are the three requirements which need to be fulfilled by a person before he can become an auditor. Firstly, he need to obtain this qualification, he need to obtain this approval from the Minister of Finance and to obtain this approval, of course, he need to have a necessary qualification so that he will be registered as a chartered accountant. Yeah, secondly, and then thirdly, of course, he have to prove that actually he is of a good character and he is competent to perform his duties as an auditor. Okay, now we are going to look at section 264. We are, still, we are still discussing with regards to the qualification of auditors. So under section 264, number one, if the auditors which is being appointed is actually a firm of accountants, and it is, it is not only a, a, a person, however, it's a firm of accountants, then under the situation, all the members in the firm, meaning all the partners in the firm must be an approved company auditors. That is the requirement number one under section 264. And number two, since the role of a company auditor is to report with regards to the company account, under the situation, he need to report this to the shareholder during the annual general meeting. And because of this, he is required to be independent of the company, meaning he cannot be closely related to the company or he can be influenced by any officer of the company. That is number two. And number three, he also cannot be indebted to the state companies in the amount in the amount more than 25,000 ringgit. So let's say if a person borrowed money from the bank in the amount of 26,000 ringgit, let's say Maybank, then under that situation, he cannot become an auditor of Maybank. And number four, under section 264, he cannot be an officer of the company, a partner, employee or employee of an officer of the company, or a partner, employee of an employee of an officer of the company, or a shareholder, or his or her spouse is an officer of the company. So meaning, an auditor 
cannot have any connection with the company at all or cannot have connection with the person who is actually working with the company. And number five, he also must not be a person who is responsible for or if he is the partner employer or employee of a person responsible for the keeping of the register of members or the register of holders of the venture of the company. So meaning this person under number five, he cannot be the person who keeps actually the register book with regard the list of the members of the state company who, which he is going to audit or he is the one who keeps the register book with regard to the holders of the venture holder of that company. Or maybe he is not the one who keeps the book. He is the employee of a partner who actually involved in keeping these register books. So under the situation, if he involved in this or maybe his employer involved in this, then he also cannot become the auditor of that company. And under number, number seven, he cannot be a bankrupt. A person who is a bankrupt cannot become an auditor of a company unless he obtain leave of the court. He seek for court approval to become an auditor and he's being allowed. Then only he become an auditor. And number seven, he also cannot be convicted with any offense involving fraud or dishonesty, which is punishable with imprisonment for three months or more. So these are the kind of offenses which involve money. Example like breach of trust. So under that situation, he he will not be allowed because he has been committed under such an offense. That under that situation, he will not be allowed to become an auditor. So now let us go on with the topics of termination of an auditor. So there are two ways how the service of an auditor can be terminated. One is through resignation and the other one is by removal. So resignation is actually the action taken by the auditor himself. Whereas removal is an action taken by the company. So let us have a look at the procedure how actually a resignation can be done. So these are the procedure which is being laid down by section 281 of the Companies Act. So whereby if an auditor wanted to resign, so he can resign though his term of service has not come to an end yet, he can still tender his resignation. So this is how it's being done. So under section 281, so if he wish to resign, then he must give notice in writing to the company and his term of office, meaning his service, will end after 21 days from the state notice which he hand over to the company or at any date which he have stated inside the notice. If there is no date, then we take it as 21 days. If we have stated inside the notice that he is going to act on behalf of the companies and only until the end of the month, then we we'll take it at the end of uh, at the end of the month. So then under section 282, once the company have received this notice, then within seven days, the company need to send a copy of this to the registrar of companies. This is under section 282. So under section 283, if this is a public company and with the state notice of resignation, the state auditor accompanied with this notice, meaning together with the state notice, he attached to it a statement stating the circumstances why he resigned. 
then under the session, under the situations, if with the state notice, this statement, he requested that the directors should convene a general meeting, then under the situation, the directors of the company shall hold a general meeting within 28 days from the day they received the state notice, requesting them to convene the general meeting by the state auditors. If he did state that he want this to be done, and he lays down actually why actually he wanted to resign and he wanted to explain this to the general, to the general meeting, then a general meeting need to be convey, convened by the uh, board of directors. And under section 285, though the state auditors had already resigned, he still have the rights actually to attend the general meetings where the financial statement which is going to be laid before the general meeting is concerning him. So he is the one who is responsible for this financial statement. Then he can actually attend the general meetings whereby he need to explain with regard to certain things inside that financial statement. Okay, this is regards to resignation. Now we are going to go on with regards to removal. This is a very harsh action which is done by the uh, companies whereby under this state situation, it is not the auditors who wanted to leave the state company. However, it's the company who, want, who don't want him anymore. Okay. And uh, in a simple words, you can say that they wanted to sack him under that situation. So how a removal can be done? So under section 276, so members of the company may remove an auditor at any time by an ordinary resolution at the general meeting where a special notice has been given to the auditor. This is how it can, it can be done. And now, let us look at the procedure, how it needs to be done. So under section 277, the special notice, which I have highlighted earlier under section 276, the special notice need to be sent to the auditor and also the registrar of companies as soon as the company receives this special notice, then this special notice need to be sent to the auditors and under that situation, once the special notice has been received by the auditor, then the auditor may within seven days after he has received the notice, he can make an explanation in writing. He can write to the company, okay, to defend himself with regards to the acquisition which is being made against him. And then he can also request the company to send the copies of these explanations to all the members who is entitled to attend the general meeting. And at the general meeting itself, he can request that his explanation be read and he can also speak to defend himself. Okay. And if a resolution had already been passed under section 276, of course, this also need to be sent to the register to the registrar under section 278. A notice to the registrar need to be sent with regard to the uh, resolution, to ordinary resolution, which have been passed by the members at the, at the general meeting. And under section, uh, before that, if let's say there is such request with regards to written explanations, so can this request be refused by the company? The company cannot refuse this request unless if there is an application by the company or any other person who is being grieved by this explanation and this application is being made to court and the court had ordered, okay, had ordered that this explanation need not be served to the members, then only the company had the right to refuse to send this explanation. Okay, 
Then we go on to section 279. So if this is a private company and there is a resolution actually, whereby under this resolution, they wanted to appoint another person as an auditor in place of the outgoing auditor, in place of the auditor which is being removed, then the company, the private company, need to send a copy of this proposal, the proposal to appoint a new auditor, to this intended auditor which is supposed to be appointed and also to the outgoing auditor, the auditor which is supposed to be removed. So this written resolution need to be sent to both of them, the incoming and also the outgoing. And under section 280, once the auditor has been removed, so another auditor can be appointed at the general meeting by way of resolution which is being passed by a majority of more than half of the members of the company, which is entitled to, to vote. So they can appoint another, another auditor actually at the uh, general meeting through vote. And it need only to pass a simple majority, which is half of the state member. So we are going to discuss with regards to duties and rights of auditors. However, first of all, first of all, let us have a look at the function of, of an auditor first. So what actually is the function of an auditor? So what, why actually an auditor is being appointed? So under the case of Fomento Sterling Area Limited versus Salesden Fountain Pen Company Limited, it has been stated by the court, his vital task is to take care to see that errors are not made, be there errors of computation, or errors of omission or downright untruths. So what this statement means is that an auditor is being appointed. The important thing why he is being appointed is to ensure that there is no errors in the documentation or the computation and the document of the company. And if there is such errors, it can be detected as early as possible. Okay, now let us go on with the rights of the auditors. So the right of the auditors, these are the power which has been given to an auditors. So with these powers, then only the auditors can exercise their duties smoothly actually. So under section 266 of section 4, the auditors will be given right of access at all reasonable time to the accounting books or records of the company and to obtain necessary information and explanation from any officer of the company as well as from any auditor of a related company. So this means that as an auditor, auditor not only can actually have access to all the documents belonging to the company and also to interview and and obtain all the information and explanation from the officers of the company. However, an auditor also have the right actually to um, interview and obtain information and explanation from other auditor from other related company which have connection with the state company where the auditor is working with. Secondly, under section 266 and section 5, this is similar to section 266, subsection 4. So, however, this is the right of access with regards to documents of a subsidiary company and the rights of access and the rights of obtaining information as explanation from the officer of a subsidiary company. And under section 266, subsection 7, this is the right of the auditor to attend the general meeting, whereby not only the auditor can attend the general meeting, however, the auditor also has right to receive notices and other communication relating to this meeting. Though an auditor actually is not 
the members of the company however he have this right and apart from that he also have the right to speak in this meeting in his capacity as an auditor and under section 266 subsection 12 so under that section if any officer of the comp company refuse or fail without lawful excuse to allow the auditor to have access to the documents or any accounting big books or other records which is in his custody once or secondly he refused or failed without lawful excuse to give any information or explanation when he is required to do so by the auditor and three if he hinders or obstructs or delays an auditor in performing his duty then under the situation he is guilty of an offense which is punishable for three years imprisonment or a fine exceeding not exceeding sorry not exceeding half million or both so because of that the officer of the company should not actually uh, conduct any of these offenses because if not he will be guilty and will, will be liable to this penalty So now, let us discuss the duties of auditors. So the auditors here have actually, and the auditors have five duties altogether. So we are going to discuss all these duties one by one. The first duty is, is actually the statutory duties of auditors. These are the duties which is being laid down by the Companies Act 216. So the first duties of the statutory duties, the first duties is the duties under section 266, subsection 1. So these duties is that the duty, the duties of the auditors is to report to the members on accounts which is required to be laid down by the auditors at the general meeting. So this is the first duties of the auditor. And the second duties is the duties under section 256, subsection 2, whereby in the said report just now, which I have mentioned to you earlier, he shall consider whether the accounts or considerated accounts are in his opinion is being drawn up firstly to give the true and fair view of the financial statement, and secondly, whether it gives a true and fair view of the company's affair, and thirdly, whether it's been pre prepared in accordance with the applicable approved accounting standards. And apart from that, so he have to state that whether in his opinion, the financial statement has been drawn up according to approved accounting standards. So not only that, he must also state if there is any defect or irregularity in the financial statement. So he has to state whether he is satisfied and if he's not satisfied, he has to give reason why he is not satisfied with the financial statement prepared. And then the duties number three, this is the duties under section 266, subsection three. So this is the duty of an auditor to form an opinion with regards to the followings. First one, he have to form an opinion as to whether he has obtained all information and explanation from the company. And then secondly, whether a proper accounting and other records is being kept by the company. And thirdly, whether the returns received from branch offices, if that if there are branch offices, whether these returns received by the company is adequate. And fourthly, whether the procedure and the method used by the company in the accounting system, whether this is adequate. So these are the duties number three. And the duties number four, under the statutory duties, is being laid down under section 266, subsection. Six, whereby 
this report, which has been done by the auditors, it shall be attached to or endorsed on the accounts or consolidated accounts. And if the member requires that this report is to be read before the companies in general meeting, then it has to be allowed and it shall be open to inspections by any member at any reasonable time. This is the statutory duties number four. The statutory duties number five, this is under section 266, subsection 8, whereby in performing his duties, if the auditor discover that is a breach or not observance of any of the provision of the Companies Act, and he knows that this matter will not be adequately dealt with by his command in the report, or if he brings it up to the attention of the directors, then under that situation, he must report in writing to the registrar of companies because he knows that nothing can be done. Yeah? Because under that situation, if he's aware that there is actually a breach of the provision of the Companies Act, and if he reports it also, nothing will be done, then under this situation, the action that he has to take is to report it to the Registrar of Company. <coughs> and the statutory duties number six is under section 266, subsection 9. If while conducting his duties, he were, in his opinion, that it involved an offense of fraud or dishonesty have been committed against the company by any officer of the company, then again, he need to report it in writing to the registrar of companies. And under both situations, under situation number five and number six, if the auditor fails to do so, then under that situation, the auditor will be guilty of an offence which is punishable by imprisonment not exceeding five years or to fine not exceeding three million or both. Okay, so now let us go on with the duty number two which is actually the duty to carry out audit by an auditor. So an auditor, as I've told you earlier, they need to form their opinions, a true and fair opinion with regards to the position of the financial statement of the company. Okay, so before, before they can do this, of course, <clears throat> they need to carry out audit first. Okay, especially when actually the accounts of the company is very complex. Then under that situation, the auditor is required to draft a certain plan or certain procedures <clears throat> how to assist him in detecting whether there are errors or whether there are fraud in existence. So only an auditor knows how to do this because they say they feel they are professional and they are qualified to do this. So let us have a look in the case of Pacific Acceptance Corporation Limited versus 4C. So what happened in this case? This case actually, so I'm not going to discuss with regard to the facts of the case. Later on, when we are discussing about other duties, so I will highlight to you the facts of the case. At the moment, we are going to focus on one of these uh, judgments with regards to this duty to carry out audit. So whereby the court held uh, under this case <clears throat> with regards to the duty to carry out audit, the court held that if there is an agreement or an audit engagement between the auditor and the company which he is supposed to audit and he signed this and he signed this audit engagement or this agreement. So meaning there is a contract between him and the company. So must he comply with that, with the terms of the state agreement? Okay. So 
these terms of the agreement which he have signed, the audit engagement which he has signed with the companies, that can only be an addition to the duties which is being laid down by the statute, by the law, by the Companies Act. So meaning he needs to give priority to the statute, to the law. He cannot differ from the statute. He cannot give priority to this engagement and avoid the provision of the statute. This is wrong. So he, he, it, is, it is a must actually for him to comply with the law, to comply with the statute. And that agreement, the audit engagement, which he have signed with the company, that will only be an addition to the duties which have been laid down under the statute. He have to comply first with the statute as how the audit is to be performed. Then only if, let's say, there are other duties, there are other duties which is stated under the audit engagement, if it's not against the law, if it's not against what is being provided under the statute, okay, he can he can actually follow that engagement or that agreement if it does not go against the law. However, if it go against the law, he cannot comply with it. He needs to he still need to follow the, the law. So the next duty is duty to report to members. Actually, these duties overlap with the uh, statutory duties which I have discussed with you. This is actually under section 266, subsection 1, subsection 2, and subsection 3. Okay. So this duty to report to members. First one which needs to be done to, by an auditor is that the main duty of the auditor is to, is that, to investigate and form an opinion on the adequacy of the company's accounting and other records. Okay. So they need to form an opinion whether whether the uh, system of accounting, all the, the, the documents, all the records pertaining to the accounting, whether it is adequate or not. And in the case of Caparo Industries, PLC versus Dickman and others, what happened in this case is that this Caparo took over Fidelity PLC and after he took over of this company, then only he discovered actually the account were in a worse state than what have been revealed by the directors of Fidelity and also the auditors of Fidelity. <clears throat> and because of that, they sued the auditor for negligent in preparing the account However, court held that actually the auditor does not owe a duty to the public. So what the court says here in this case is that the function of the auditors is to ensure as far as possible that the financial information as to the complete affairs which is being prepared by the auditors is accurate and it reflects the company position is in order. Why is it so? First, to protect, to protect the company itself from the consequences of undetected errors or if there is a wrongdoing. And secondly, to provide the shareholders with reliable intelligence for the purpose of enabling them to scrutinize the conduct of the company's affairs and whether they need to exercise their collective powers under that situation. Okay, this is the first one. The second one, under the duty to report to members, the auditor then need to report to the members of the company on the accounts required to be laid before the company in the general meeting. The auditors are required to state in their report whether in their opinion the accounts are properly drawn up and whether it is in accordance with the provision of the company's act or not. Okay, this is the second. The duties and the duties to report to members. And the third one, this does not mean that the auditors cannot communicate their findings and seek explanation from officers of the company. In fact, they have this power, which we have discussed earlier under section 266 with regard to the rights of auditors. 
we know that <coughs> the auditors have access to the documents, the, doc the auditors can seek explanations and information from officers of the company. Okay, they cannot make it. Okay, and if let's say they found out actually there is fraud involved, it is the duty of the auditors to report it to the directors or the management and no need for them to wait until the general meeting and report it to the members because that will be too late. In, for, in fact, as I have highlighted to you earlier, under section 266, subsection 9, if there are fraud involved, then actually what the director need to do, they need, if it cannot be dealt with adequately by reporting it to the superior, they need actually to report it to the registrar of companies. And if it fails, and if he fails to do that, then there is a punishable. They can be punishable for imprisonment not exceeding five years or to find not exceeding three million ringgit. This is very clear. So now let us have a look at the case of WA Cheap and Park Company Property Limited versus Otto Young and Company. So what happened in this case is this, Johnson, the company's finance and administration manager, made certain unauthorized drawings between 1978 and 1980. The drawings actually were advances for travel purposes which have exceeded the actual claims. Johnson also apart from that used the facility whereby Employees could use the company's name to obtain trade discounts for personal purchases. And by September 1980, what Johnson did is that what he have done, he have used all this facility in excess of $64,000. Okay. The auditors actually become aware of what had been done by Johnson's early in 1978. However, what they did, they only discussed the matter with Johnson and one of his subordinate. And they did not actually report it to the superiors. They did not report it to his boss, to the director of the company. The auditor only decided that, okay, let us leave the issue until next year. And finally, in 1980, Johnson's personal, personal account was brought to the attention of the superior. However, during that time, it's too late. Johnson was being suspended and he subsequently absconded. He disappeared. And under the situation, the court held that actually the auditors were negligent because they failed to take action over Johnson's account until 1980. So they had actually breached their duty, though they did not suspect there is fraudulent dealings conducted by Johnson. Okay, now we are going to discuss section 264 with regard duties to be independent. So as an auditor, there is a requirement under the law. This requirement I have discussed earlier on the qualification to become a director. I have discussed it in detail, whereby under that requirement, it shows that an auditor needs to be independent. If not, he will be disqualified. He cannot, he cannot become an auditor. Why is it the director needs to be independent? And what does it mean by being independent? So this is because once an auditor agreed to become an auditor of a company. So the report which he prepared must not be biased. If he is not independent, then under that situation, how is he going to prepare a true and fair view of the company's position? Or the record, the financial position of the company. So that's why an auditor need to be independent. So let us have a look in the, in the case of Retransplanters Holding Company Limited, whereby the judge in that case states that 
Once a man takes upon himself the position of auditor, he must stand aloof and divorce from the aims, objects, and activities of the company. What is meant by this? What does actually the judge mean? The judge means that once you agree to become an auditor, in fact, I have discussed with you all earlier, if a person agrees to become auditor, he must give his consent in writing. So meaning he accepted his position of, of an auditor. And once he accepted this, he must actually under that situation keep away you know, from any activities of the company, any aims or objects of the company. So this is to avoid from being biased. That is number one. Number two, the auditor then need to report to the members of the company on the accounts required to be sorry, sorry, student. So once the auditor need to report to the members of the company on the accounts required to be laid down before the company, this does not mean that the auditor must severe all connection with the company because to be able for an auditor to do this, to conduct this under section 266, they need access to all the documents, they need explanation and information. So what need to be done by an auditor is, that, is just that. They need to guard themselves against the conflict of interest. That's all. And under number three, under the duty to be independent, we know that under section 266, which I have discussed with you earlier, with regards to the right of auditors, auditor, auditors need to seek assistance from the company directors, accountants, and other officers of the comp company in, in carrying out their function as an auditors. So it's not wrong for them to seek this assistance. However, they are in breach of their duty if they rely on this officer for information on which they are required to form their own independent opinion. So meaning, the opinion is not his opinion. The opinion is the opinion of the, of the officers of the company. So this is wrong. So they need to give their professional opinion by using their expertise as audit auditor and not from relying on some other people's opinion. So let us have a look at the case of Dominion Freeholders Limited versus Eid, whereby in this case, the auditor prepared an erroneous report. The company then brought an action against this auditor for breach of his contractual for breach of his contractual duty of care, and then he sought to join the company's accountant as a co-defendant. So meaning now, he wanted to put the blame on the accountant of the company. Because why? Because he said it is the accountant who, who had supplied him with the incorrect information and actually this accountant was in breach of duty owed to him. However, this application was then rejected by the court. What the judge says in that case is that, the auditors must not rely or depend on company officers for information or representations in respect of matters upon which they are required in the course of their duties to reach an independent conclusion. And if they do so rely, they cannot shed their responsibility by casting the liability onto the company officer or officer's consent. Meaning here, what the judge is trying to say that an auditor cannot shift his duties to somebody else. So he has to be responsible for what he, he did. So now we are going to discuss the final duty of an auditor which is the duty of care and skill. So this duty of care and skill is actually a common law duty. 
so meaning this is a duty which is being laid down by the English law. So the duty of care and skill, as I told you earlier, is a common law duty to exercise reasonable care and skill in performing his duty as an auditor. And if he fails to use reasonable care and skill, it will make the auditor liable for one, breach of contract, and secondly, for negligence under law of thought. So meaning, one, as I told you just now, the liability under contract, under law of contract, as laid down by the case of Pacific Acceptance Corpora Corporation Limited versus Fawcett, we have discussed earlier this case with regards to duty to carry out audit, and now we are going to discuss it here, under liability under the law of contract and the duty of care and skill, whereby the judge in that case state that it is beyond question that when an auditor professing as he does to possess the requisite professional skills enters into a contract to perform certain tasks as auditor, he promised to perform such tasks using that degree of skill and care as reasonable in the circumstances as they then exist. What the judge means here is this. So, an auditor with, with this special skill as an auditor, and they enter into a contract with the company as an auditor. They consent to be appointed as auditor. Then under that contract, they need to perform their task as an auditor. So we know that when there is a contract, I have taught you, Last time, under law of contract, when there is a contract, there is a privity of contract under both parties, meaning the contract between the company and also the auditor, the offer and the offering. So there is a privity of contract and once one of the party breach this contract, then the other party have the right to sue damages. So meaning, if the auditor fails to perform his task as an auditor by using his professional skill, he breached this contract. And if he breached this contract, then the company is entitled to sue him for damages. This is under the law of contract, number one, under the law of contract. And number two, liability under the law of thought. This is liability in negligent. So, under this situation, the liability in negligence, under the law of thought, a professional, an auditor is a professional, they owe the duty of care to their clients. Who is their client? The client is the company. So, an auditor who uses less than the required degree of care and skill is liable to the company for any loss suffered as a result. But it's not liable only because of failure to detect errors of fraud. Not only they are liable because they fail to detect error of fraud, but they are liable because they use less than the required degree of care and skill. Why we say that they, they use less than the required degree of care and skill? Because they fail to perform as what is being performed by other auditors. If they fail to perform as what other auditors have done, then we say that they are negligent. It's not because they fail to detect the errors or they fail to detect the frauds. However, they fail to perform as what is being done by other professionals in their field. So under that situation, they are liable under negligent under the law of thought. Okay, then, what is the standard of care that we expect from, from this auditor? So, previously, previously, the standard of care is much more lower from what is expected now. So, previously, we have the case of Re Kingston Cotton Mill Company, number two, whereby in that case, this is a, it's a very old case, so, as I told you just now, 
the situation is not applicable now because now the standard of care is much more higher. So what happened in that case is that the auditors have failed to detect certain frauds perpetrated by the company's director. Why they fail to do that? Because they rely on false certificates supplied by the director as to the value of the stock without calculating the stock in trade at the beginning of the year. They did not look at this. And later on, an action was brought against the auditors by the company seeking to recover the loss caused by wrongful payment of dividends. And because the company actually did not make profit and they still pay dividends because they based on the report prepared by the auditors. And now they are suing the auditors. However, what was held by the court? The court held that the auditors were not in breach of duty. The standard of care does not require them to take stock, no need to check the stock. They were entitled to rely on the manage, manager's certificate as there were no grounds for suspicions, for suspicions and the manager was widely regarded as a man of good character and trust, Woody. Just because the auditors could have discovered the fraud had they valued the stock themselves, did not mean that they were in breach of duty. As I told you, this is a very old case. So now the situation is different. So now we are going to look at the situation now. Now it's much more higher. We have three cases to reflect, to reflect the true situation now. So let us have a look at the case of Ray Thomas Gerard and Sons Limited. In this case, it involved a company's managing director, which had over a period of years been making obvious alteration to invoices which he received from suppliers. He altered all these all these invoices. And some of these invoices had come to the attention of the auditors. However, they just rely on the stock taking procedure which is being set up by the managing director, by this managing director. They just ignore the said invoices which had been altered. Okay? So, um, the auditors did not investigate the matter any further. Soon after discovery of the true situation, the company went into liquidation. And now the liquidator brought an action against the auditors. The judge in this case held that the auditors were liable to the company because once altered invoices had been discovered, the auditor is supposed to put on inquiry and it was not sufficient that they merely sought assurance from the managing director. They cannot just rely on the managing director. Okay, so the judge says, the auditors ought then to have examined the supplier's statement and where necessary, they should have communicated with the suppliers. And then, they should actually inform, inform the board of directors. In fact, this case, this situation does not involve an isolated failure. It does not happen once. However, it has been going on for, for, for many years. And because of that, the auditors had therefore failed in their duty to exercise reasonable care and skill. This is in the case of Ree Thomas Chirai. And in this popular case of Pacific Acceptance Corporation, which I have used several times when I was discussing the duty to carry out audit, I have, I have been referring to this case. Whereby I said that if there is an agreement between the company and the auditors, you should give priority to the law office, then only you follow the said agreement. So that is when I was discussing the duty to carry out audit. And just now, when I was discussing under the law of contract pertaining to the uh, duty of care and skill, I also refer I also refer to this case, to the case, to this case of Pacific Acceptance Corporation. Why is it under under the law of contract? There is a privity of contract. Okay. And when 
in order to enter into this contract actually they promise that they will perform their duties using their skill their expertise and if they fail to do that actually there is a breach of contract and so now again i'm going to use this case in measuring the standard of care whereby so now i'm going to highlight on the facts of this case so in this case actually the auditors had not checked the mortgage but had relied on on Thompson solicitors to ensure that they were properly executed and registered. A mortgage, a charge, which is being created <clears throat> and the auditors did not check it. What the auditors did, they only relied on the um, information given by the lawyers of the borrower. This is not the lawyers of the company. This is the lawyers of the borrower. And uh, the court have actually, the auditors is in breach of their duties because they did not satisfy themselves by proper means that the intended mortgages were properly executed and registered. They did not check whether it's being, it's being registered or not at the uh, title office, at the land office. They should have examined the original document and they should have go to the state title office, to the state title office and conduct a search themselves. And not by relying to the solicitor, solicitors of the borrower. In fact, this is not the solicitors of their client. This is actually wrong. Okay. And the last case here, with regard to the standard of care, which I say is much more higher here, is in the case of AWA Limited versus Daniels. So this AWA Limited is a New South Wales Supreme Court case. Okay, so this case had held that the auditor in this case failed to exercise reasonable care and skill. So meaning there is a breach of duty here to exercise uh, care and skill. Why? Because the court found that the auditor is fully aware of this situation. Firstly, they are aware that for about two months, AVH have been changing their record keeping system. They are aware that the record keeping system of AWA have been exchanged and there is no proper accounting reports in relation to foreign exchange trading. No proper accounting reports has been kept with regards to this kind of trading. Number one, they are fully aware of this. The auditor is aware of this. And number two, the auditor is also fully aware that the senior EWA manager had not heeded his warning. He did not give his warning to the companies. He did not pay attention actually to the company's internal control in relation, in relation to foreign exchange trading. And actually, this internal control is inadequate and they just don't, 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 don't bother about it. So the auditors is aware of this, aware of of uh, the senior AWA managers inadequacy in conducting this, this problem. And thirdly, the auditor is also fully aware that the foreign exchange trading was not tied into the AWA computerized account. So it is not inside the computer. It was not tied, was not tied inside the computer then. And number four, the auditor is also fully aware that this foreign exchange trading was both a very risky audit area and this is also a very high commercial risk. And number five, the auditor also is fully aware that this foreign exchange trading was an area where internal controls are critical and lastly the auditor also is fully aware that AWA exposure to foreign exchange losses was high the, the probabilities that they are going to suffer loss is high and actually under these situations the court held that the auditors fully aware of the above matters However, they failed to warn promptly the company's director of the differences in the accounting records and inadequate internal control.
This means that they have breached their duty to exercise reasonable care and skill. So meaning, as an auditor, not only the auditor need to check the accounting system, okay, and just ignore actually what have been going on inside the company. So as long as they did not go against the law, then the auditor can just ignore it. That is wrong. That is wrong. So as a skillful auditor, yeah, the auditor need to put more effort. So they have to be a little bit busybody with regards to certain situations. And especially if the situations might harm the company. So this is what happened in EWE Limited versus Daniel. Okay, this is with, still with regards to the uh, final duties. However, we are going to look at the duties of the auditors, the liability of the audit auditors towards the shareholders and outsiders. So this now we are discussing with regards to the duty of care and skill. We know that after we have been discussing this topic this now, we knew actually that an auditor owes his duty of care and skill to the companies. But what about the shareholders and outsiders? Since the contract is actually between the company and the auditors, the uh, auditors enter into a contract with the company. The privity of contract is between the two of them only. So, and of course, the shareholders and these outsiders, they does not have this privity of contract. So under law of contract, they are actually nobody. Then under the situation, can they take action against the auditor? So under the law of contract, of course, they cannot take any action. So if an auditor then fail to exercise a reasonable standard of care, so what action need to be taken by the shareholder and outsiders? So the only action they can take is under the law of thoughts, under negligent, but not under the law of contract. And in order for these shareholders or outsiders to succeed in their claim against the auditors, first of all, they need to prove that the auditors actually owes them a duty of care in carrying out the audit and in making their reports. So now we wanted to look at actually does this auditor owes them the duty of care? So previously, this duty of care, which is being owed by an auditor, is only towards their client who is actually the company and not to outsiders, meaning not to the shareholders and not to other outsiders. So we have discussed Kaparu when I was discussing with regards to the duty to report to members. In the case of Kaparo, uh, when Kaparo wanted to take over Fidelity, and then uh, he realized that the account is in a worse state, and, now, and, and then he, he suing the auditor, and, and, and he failed. Because uh, court held, it's not the duty of the auditor to report to outsiders. Yes. Yeah. However, this is a very old case. And this is similar with Kaiba. So this is a situation previously. Okay? I will change, the situation has changed now. So I will let you look, look at the, apart from the case of Kaparu, let us have a look at the case of Kettler versus Crane, Christmas and Company Limited. Whereby um, the court help. The auditor only owes a duty of care and skill to, to their client. In this case, what happened is was that uh, the court held that the accountants was not liable to outsiders, investors who had relied on a negligently prepared report. They have re prepared the report negligently. However, the court held that the accountants was not liable because they are outsiders. Because the court held this was because there was no contract between the accountants and the outsiders. And because of that, they were under no duty of, of care. However, the situation has changed since the case of Hadley Burns versus Heller. 
So in the case of Halley Burn versus Heller, in that case, what happened actually in this case of Halley Burn? Halley Burn actually is an advertising agent and they wanted to know the credit worthiness of their client. And they made an inquiry to Heller whereby they were informed that the situation of the said customer is considered good for its ordinary business engagement. However, what Heller did in this case is that there, he, he, he made use of this exclusion clause. Apart from uh, this statement, there is also an exclusion clause involved where that in this exclusion clause, it says that without responsibility on the part of the bank, so meaning whatever statement they give, the bank will not be responsible. And later on, actually, uh, and even suffer losses because actually the customer, uh, he, he is, is uh, monetary condition is not good. And because then, because of that, they uh, suffer losses and they so handle for the seat. Information is now, however, the court how actually, they were not liable because of the exclusion clause, not because 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 Ellie Ellie Bunt, uh, is an outsider to the state to the state report. So the most important thing in this case is the law which is being laid down by the court, whereby the judge in this case states that this is a situation now, and it's being laid down in this case. Number one, this one. What is mistake by the court? It is if someone possesses a special skill undertakes to apply that skill for the assistance of another person who relies on such skill, a duty of care will arise. So meaning, if somebody possesses a special skill and he undertakes to assist another with this special skill, he owes a duty of care to the other person, and he cannot breach that duty of care. This is number one. And number two can be seen from the case of Snardock and Associate Property Limited versus Paramata City Council, whereby this is a Australia case where the High Court also held that the duty to take reasonable care arises whenever a person gives information or advice to another upon a serious matter in circumstances where speaker relies or ought to realize that he is being trusted to give the best of his information or advice as a basis for action on the other party. The speaker comes under a duty to exercise reasonable care. So meaning here, <coughs> if a professional <coughs> is fully aware <coughs> or he ought to become aware that he is being trusted, that somebody is being relying on on what information he's been giving, what advice he's been giving, giving, then if we're aware that that particular outsider is going to use this information, then you'll be liable to the outsiders. Okay, this is the second one. Meaning if for an auditors, if the auditors is aware or, or should have become aware that their report may have been used by a particular outsider, then the auditor will be liable to that outsiders. So that is what is being laid down by the case of Nadok. And in the case of Harrison versus Carson Beckman Rutley, in this case, what happens is that this auditor, of course, he is an expert in, in his field, he was requested to value the share of this company for the purpose of determining what is the fair value of that share to be paid for the shares under a contract of sale. So meaning there is a contract of sale going on and this expert is aware of this and uh, based on his report, on his relations, the share then was sold at the price which is below another relation which has been prepared later on. So many now, the company suffer loss because they sell their share at a low price. Whereas there is another financial report saying that actually the, the 
real religion is higher than that. And because of this, the seller not brought an action for negligence against the auditor, alleging that that original report, the earlier original report which is being made by the, by the auditor is negligent. And the court held that an expert who valued the share knowing that the relation would be used by the buyer and the seller in calculating the price for the share, he was liable to both of them if he or she made the relation negligently. Okay, that is in the case of Aronson. Now, let us have a look at the case of Scott Group Limited versus McFarlane. This is a New Zealand case. Whereby in this case, the auditors of this company negligently prepared this audit report and then this audit report which they prepared was filed with the registrar of companies. And then later on, this report which he had filed with the registrar of companies was relied upon by an outsider who want to make a takeover bid of the company. He wanted to take over the company, okay? And he relies on his report. And the court of appeal held that the auditors ought to owe a duty of care to person whom they knew or ought to have known would rely on the large accounts which they had audited. So meaning, if they ought to know that there are certain part people, certain parties who, have, who are going to rely on their report, they are liable towards that party. So the court held the auditors ought reasonably to have been aware that there is a takeover may occur and in such an event, the large account would be relied upon. However, the court, however, rejected the contention that an auditor's duty of care extended to anyone who examines the annual return at the registrar office. As I told you, they will only be liable to a particular outsider just now. To a particular outsider who they are aware is going to use the report. Not to any kind of outsiders. So this is the last topic in our discussion today pertaining to auditors. This is in regards to the immunity of an auditor. So under section 286, subsection 1 of the Companies Act, it says that an auditor shall not, in the absence of malice on his part, be liable to any action for defamation at the suit of any person in respect of any statement which he makes in the course of his duties as an auditor, whether the statement is made orally or in writing. So meaning... A civil suit, a court action cannot be taken against an auditor for defamation just because of the report that he prepared. Because he is actually performing his duties and because of that, he is being protected under this section. And secondly, under section 286, section 3, it says, an auditor should not be liable to be sued in any court or be subject to any criminal or disciplinary proceedings for any report under Section 266 submitted by the auditor in good faith in the intended performance of any duty imposed on the auditor under this Act. So under Section 286, Subsection 3, this is pertaining to criminal or disciplinary Proceedings. Subsection 1 is now, this is a civil action and this one is a criminal action. So, meaning under Section 286, Subsection 3, a criminal action also cannot be taken against an auditor just because they prepared this report according to Section 266. We know under Section 266, they need to prepare this report. They have uh, an assess to all kinds of accounting documents and uh, after that they have these um, under sections 266 also these duties of auditors 
they have a duty to report to members. And if let's say in any of this report, they reveal something which is against any statutes. So however, they are being protected under the law. No criminal action can be taken against them. If through that report, they have revealed certain certain uh, information which is against the law. So this is not like the case of Rafizi because in the case of Rafizi, Rafizi is actually uh, not an auditor and what is being revealed by him is actually against Bafia. And he is, is not eligible to claim this immunity. This immunity is only for an auditor when an auditor is performing their duties which is being laid down by the by the law, by the Companies Act.